Hey everyone, Sontide here, or Ralph. Uh, today we're going to be doing something a bit different. See, I've received a lot of messages lately from friends about these two new papers that have been published. Um, superconductor lead copper phosphate oxide, showing levitation at room temperature and atmospheric pressure and mechanism, and the first room temperature ambient pressure superconductor. And these things have been on the news a lot uh, lately in the past few days. Uh, because if this is true, uh, if what they report in this paper is true and reproducible and can be used to make things, uh, this, like, without a doubt, without exaggeration, just changes everything about how we live our lives. Um, people have been trying to chase, chase these room temperature superconductors for, like, years and years and years and years, I think decades at this point. Uh, because they have so many cool different properties. Um, basically, if you don't know, um, conductors, normal conductors, are things like, uh, you know, wires or like headphone cables, or at least the metals that are in these guys. Uh, they can be used to transfer information or power or energy um, because they have these charged, they have charged, because charged matter can easily flow inside them. They basically act like a little pipe uh, for these charged particles to go through. Um, so charged particles like electrons, they feel some sort of force from some external electron field and they create their own, which basically means that if you have some sort of charge source on uh, one end of the whole thing, uh, it can cause a force that goes through the entire thing and transfer information or power that way. The thing is though that normal conductors aren't perfect. There might be little uh, errors in the metals that make it. So that means that whenever charged particles move, uh, they have some sort of loss of energy. They just lose a little bit of energy. Which you aren't really going to notice on the level of like uh, this guy. But you might notice if you own an electrical generation company, for example. These things warm up, create a lot of heat, and this inefficiency just really adds up over time. Superconductors are special because they suddenly, below some particular temperature, have no waste of energy. They are perfect conductors and electricity transfers through without any external field. Which is pretty cool. It's basically like what you might imagine sort of infinite energy machine. It just goes on and goes on and goes on forever. And this has a bunch of cool other side effects. Uh, for example, uh, if you have a magnet near superconductors, you activate what is called the Meissner effect. Not too much of an expert on that. Basically just means that magnets can float. Uh, which means that uh, this can actually be used in the modern day. So things like uh, the bullet trains in Japan use superconducting, use superconductors and magnets to make sure that their trains have no friction at the rails, so you don't have to like move your wheel across a railway like you might normally do. And this means that they can go at super super high speed. Um, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva uh, uses superconducting and magnets to basically help accelerate their particles as quickly as possible. So, yeah, uh, superconductors are really, really actively used today, but the fact that you need to put them into, like, these such low temperatures or such high pressures mean that it's really, really hard to use for, like, normal uses. You're only going to be using them on the level of these massive, massive things. So if you can make room temperature ambient pressure superconductors, that means we can use some things like, we can make some things like hoverboards, or floating cars or stuff that you might have seen back to the future. Or your energy price might just go down because the other the electricity companies don't need to waste energy and whatever else. So yeah, these things are super, super cool. If this is true. And that is the interesting controversy about this paper because there are a few things that a lot of experts um, find quite odd about this. Um, I myself am not what I would call an expert in this. Um, I do work with condensed matter physics, which is sort of like a domain of physics that this is. Uh, condensed matter physics is basically the physics of solids, um, of materials, of like the things that are in our life. I prefer to call it material physics. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't work with superconductors. I work with what I call, with what are called ferroelectrics, which are just electric materials that have polarization. I had a video on it at some point. But yeah, what it does mean, because I am in this field of condensed matter physics, I have some understanding of the techniques they use, but it's like, you know, I might be like an expert in baking donuts, but I'm not an expert in baking cakes. Um, so <laughs> if that analogy makes any sense at all, I like sort of understand what they're doing, but I'm like not an expert. So in some sense, take what I say with a grain of salt. 
This is just one dude's opinion and understanding. But yeah, I thought we would just go through this paper bit by bit and see what they say, and I'll try and decode it for you. So yeah, um, the main paper we're going to talk about is this one. This one with three authors, the first room temperature, ambient pressure superconductor. And yeah, so if you've never read a scientific paper before, it always starts with what we call an abstract. An abstract is just a summary of everything that goes in through the paper. Um, this is pretty useful and cool in general case because oftentimes scientific papers are blocked behind some sort of paywall. Um, you need to pay a lot of money to read scientific papers. An abstract is basically the blurb of a book. It summarizes everything that you need to know about the paper and they should be access free. What's interesting actually about this paper is this paper was published on Archive, A-R-X-I-V. Uh, I believe the X might be supposed to be a Greek letter. But yeah, so what Archive is, is Archive is a way for scientists to post their work, uh, to post their papers before they actually get published in these like pay to publish uh, journals. It's basically a free way that everyone can read these papers. So actually I'm going to link these papers in the description so you can actually read this paper yourself. This archive paper is free. Once it's published in a real journal, so to speak, uh, you may need to pay to access it or they will have to pay to publish it, one or the other. Anyway, uh, that being said, I think that's actually the first thing that means that we need to be cautious about it. Uh, this was published on Archive, which is available to publish without any scrutiny or checks. Um, no one immediately, no one had to check this before it was published. If something is published in a scientific journal, it goes under what's called peer review, where a few other scientists who are independent of this paper need to read it and just give it like a thumbs up or a thumbs down or a fix these things for me before I give it a thumbs up. Uh, this did not undergo that process. So this was basically written by three dudes and posted online. Basically like a very, very, very fancy Reddit post. <laughs> so yeah, with that in mind, this is the abstract. So this is what we, our first, what, what their overall summary of their work is going to be. Basically, they say that for the first time in the world, we succeed in synthesizing the first room temperature superconductor. Uh, they say uh, TC is a 400 Kelvin. Basically, this means that below 400 Kelvin, it is a superconductor, uh, which is 127 degrees. I probably should check in Fahrenheit, um, but it's a lot. Um, I think it's probably like 200, 300 Fahrenheit. Um, it is above the boiling point of water. Um, and they do this with what they call a modified lead appetite structure. Um, lead is a atom in the periodic table. Oh, too interesting about that. It can be a bit dangerous, uh, but lead is already known to have a lot of cool other applications and a lot of cool other materials. Um, and then they say that they prove the uh, superconductivity of lead with a few different techniques. And they say that a superconductivity originates from a minute structural distortion by a slight volume shrinkage. In other words, that the, that the material itself shrinks slightly and this shrinking causes some emergent superconductivity. Uh, this is a very vague sentence. Um, in my own mind, basically, I would assume that this means that this shrinking causes some sort of inbuilt strain or pressure, which then creates something else. So maybe this shrinkage causes the pressure, but as is in this line alone, it's not very obvious. Um, they say the shrinkage is caused by copper substitution of lead two plus ions in the insulating network. Um, replace big thing with small thing thing shrinks um, and therefore the stress uh, moves over and creates that distortion which creates superconducting quantum wells in the surface um, yeah so basically all they're saying is that in this material they make they create some stresses inside the material which causes superconductivity uh, that's a fair enough analogy a fair, a fair enough explanation but we need to really clear this in more detail. So yeah, um, that's the abstract on. Now this is the paper in full. Um, the introduction is usually just the place where we can contextualize the work, what's interesting about it. So basically like the introduction I did in this video where I explained why we care about superconductivity. Uh, they're going to probably go through the same sort of things. So they say we've sort of been looking for room temperature conductors for a long time through both experiment and theory. Uh, theory basically trying to simulate what different uh, electrons might do and whatever else. Um, they say the recent success of developing room temperature conductors with hydrogen sulfide and yttrium superhydride has great attention worldwide. Um, 
we're going to put a pin in this. Just remember that I do talk about the superconductivity of hydrogen sulfide and yttrium superhydride, but I'll get back to that later. Uh, but yeah, so they say that while these things are cool, it is, again, really hard to use in daily life because really high pressure or lower temperatures. So we're just trying to overcome this. And they say they introduced this paper by saying that they have been successful in synthesizing that sort of golden thing. Um, we have room temperature, ambient pressure, superconductor. Yay. Uh, they call this material LK99, and they prove it with these techniques. So yeah, we're going through it. They're going through basically through the abstract again. Um, and they prove this uh, with... Well, they look at this in the form of X-ray diffraction, or XRD, uh, X-ray photoelectron X spectroscopy, XPS, electron, okay, a bunch of techniques. Um, we'll probably go through these as they become relevant. I'm not an expert in all of these, I'm an expert in some of these, but we'll get to that when we get to that. So yeah, and they're going to report this. So, they start off with their very cool uh, superlativity data, which is actually, like, really, really cool, and really cool for explaining things. So, this is a plot of, on the x-axis, current, and on the y-axis, voltage. What they do to check for conductivity is they apply some sort of current, and they read the voltage needed to sustain that current. Now, if you've done high school physics, you might remember uh, V equals IR or whatever else. So, voltage equals current times resistance. So, if resistance is zero, voltage equals zero, no matter what the current is. And that's what they say by the sort of horizontal line we have in the center. Uh, what the different colors mean is they're looking at different temperatures. So this black one is at 298 Kelvin, this blue one is at 318 Kelvin, and so on and so forth. Basically, the what this is saying is that under particular currents and particular pressures, we don't need any voltage to sustain, the current, and therefore we have room temperature superconductivity. Well, at the, the temperatures they highlight. Um, so at, for example, this highest one at 298 Kelvin, we can sustain a current of at least around 200, 250 milliamps without any applied voltage. Um, at a higher temperature at 358 Kelvin, we can only go up to around 50 to 100 or so. Um, and I think this is, yeah, and this is interesting because this sort of highlights what's so interesting and cool about superconductivity. Like, it's not a gradual drop to zero, um, to zero resistance. It doesn't rapidly, it doesn't drop and gradually change the superconductivity. There is a rapid drop at particular conditions. Uh, we have things that we call a breakdown current and this breakdown or critical temperature. At particular temperatures, we suddenly lose superconductivity. And at critical currents, we suddenly lose conductivity, and they sort of affect one another. Uh, normally, because we have that V equals IR relationship, we have this straight line that we would expect of things to follow. So if you take this pink line of this segment and this pink line over this segment, you can imagine this would follow a sort of straight diagonal line in this one-to-one -one ratio, which would be that native resistance. But we do get the sudden drop to zero resistance. So yeah, basically they sort of show and prove that at different temperatures, we have this superconductivity. Um, this plot over here is more or less the same sort of thing. So, well, not only do we get breakdown of superconductivity as a function of temperature and of current, we can also get it as a function of uh, magnetic field. So this is Ersteds, which is a measurement of magnetic field. And they're basically they're saying at higher uh, magnetic fields, at higher Ersted values, the current needed to break down superconductivity gets lower and lower. Basically, overall, to summarize that, uh, in actually all superconductors, um, they lose conductivity if the temperature gets too high, if the magnetic field gets too high, or if the applied current goes too high, or if all three of these happen at the same time. They affect one another. And yeah, they're saying that under the right conditions of current, magnetic field, and temperature, we get this superconducting properties. Uh, figure, I think I'm going in a weird order here, but in figure E, they show the critical current as a function of temperature, so they're basically saying that these are the currents you need to, to cause that breakdown. Um, this is, I believe, what they said, a measurement of a thin film. So B is a is how they is them showing the zero sensitivity with a thin film. Thin films are cool. I would love to talk about thin films, but this is not the appropriate video for that. Um, I still think both most of this vid most of this paper is on the bulk material.
but I like thin films. I work on thin films. Now, figure D, I'm going to skip through just because I'm not an expert in the technique and I'm worried I'm going to say something wrong if I try. So let's move on to figure F, which is basically the same as figure E, um, where they basically show that the current needed to break down superconductivity um, is also a relation of the magnetic field. So this figure, figure one, is basically them showing the conditions under which they have superconductivity as a function of um, magnetic field of temperature and of current. So yeah, basically we're saying this is being superconductivity, this is being superconducting, and these are the results we get. Uh, this whole section is basically um, in a, a discussion of what they see here. Um, they're saying, yeah, they did this and this and this. Um, they mentioned that the material is polycrystalline, which basically means that um, it's it's a bunch of rows stuck together. Um, it's not just like one uniform perfect thing. It's just a bunch of things that are like layered around like sheets, the sheets in 3D space. And in doing so, it means that there are some of these imperfections um, that do change things up. Um, they grain boundaries, they're called. And they're saying that this thing isn't like perfectly, perfectly straight just because these ground green boundaries have an effect. Uh, that's that's a perfectly normal statement. Um, I have nothing wrong with that. Um, so yeah, figure two is XRD, and I love XRD. Um, X-ray diffraction is my life. Uh, sometimes <laughs> on some days. Um, XRD is basically a technique to see the, to actually probe and see what the crystal structure actually looks like. You can use it for two things. Um, one, you can use it as a sort of fingerprinting. Like, you can take XRD of your structure compared to a known XRD of the same structure and just be like, ha ha, uh, this is what I say it is. Alternatively, you can look at changes in an XRD structure, um, an XRD spectra to see the changes in the actual crystal structure itself. So in red here, we have the theoretical uh, structure of let appetite, uh, which they got from that database. And in black here, we have the real data that they actually got from their measurements. Uh, so if we're just fingerprinting it, basically we can see that the same sort of positions of those peaks, those red lines are in very similar positions to those black lines. Uh, whenever we see a red line, we see a black line of around the same proportional height. Like, so these three red lines are medium in height. We have a big line that's red and next to it are three black lines of similar heights and one a massive black line over there. Um, they say that there is these mysterious like bumps that don't really correlate to anything. They say that this is a impurity of copper sulfide, I believe it is. Um, one thing that does initially draw my eye as like a x-ray diffraction user um, is that the position of the peaks doesn't perfectly match um, what they actually say they get. So what they, well, at least they should get right uh, basically you can see that the red line is slightly to the left of the black line in every single situation right we have the red line and the black line immediately to the right of it you can see that all the way through but this is actually what they address in the paper which is pretty cool um so they say that um their material has a slight shrinkage compared to the theoretical lead appetite and this is what i mean by the second way you can use xr Ray diffraction. If we get a shift towards the left, so if the material is slightly to the left, that means that the material is bigger than we expect, or the crystal is bigger than we expect, and if the material moves slightly to the right, the material is smaller than we expect. And this is what they say here. They say that they get a slight shrinkage of 0.48% uh, in volume, uh, which they calculate, I assume, from that change in um, the, the change in the peak position. Um, yeah, so going through the paper a bit more, they say that, this is a strange line, but sure, humankind has long learned the properties of matter stem from its structure. Um, yeah, we call this the material structure property relationship. <laughs> so it actually has its own unique name because we talk about this so much. Uh, yeah, so they say that normally we have an established conductivity, um, and they say it's usually temperature and pressure, so I guess they're saying that there must be something to do with structure. It seems stress generated by decrease in volume under the low temperature high pressure causes a mini strain or distortion. Um, yeah, this is true. This is observed. You can observe this in thin films all the time. Um, although it's difficult to observe the minor changes in superconductive materials, the structure change seems to bring the superconductivity of it. Again, big if true. Uh, we need to talk about it a bit more and explain it a bit more. Okay, but here we go. So they say that usually superconducting happens uh, because of external factors, again, pressure and temperature, or internal factors like oxygen in the case of copper oxide superconductors. 
they say that usually we get a higher TC, so we get superconductivity at higher temperatures under pressure. Uh, I believe this is no an anonymous food. Um, okay, and now they say that it is thought that the stress generated by the inconsistency of the amount of change in the C axis and A and B axis. Uh, C axis means up, down, A axis means like left, right, and forward, back. Um, or at least the C axis is the biggest thing, and A and B axis is the small thing. So in the case of hexagon, it's the height of this sort of hexagon as opposed to the length of the hexagon. Um, it's fact, like a hexagonal prism anyways. Um, when the iron selenide monolayer on the top of the insulator is stacked, the highest temperature is blah. Okay, so they're comparing to other papers, which is good, uh, which we always like to see. They argue that the stress caused by temperature and pressure brings a minute structural distortion and strain, which creates electronic state for superconductivity. So yeah, basically they're saying that in normal superconductors, the external stress causes distortion and strain. Again, big if true, um, material scientists, including myself, have played with structural distortions and strains a lot. Uh, it's one of the coolest and most fun ways you can change materials and get cool properties. Um, yeah. And if it was never the external pressure and more the internal crystal structure, um, that's that's super, super cool. Um, so, okay, in A here they have the structure so we can see that, oh yeah, we can see this sort of hexagon, right? And hexagon stacked off itself to get these cool things. You can hexagon with other things around it. You can see that we have the hexagon of this lead 2 plus, um, which should be stacking on top of one another. This is viewed from the, yep, yeah, so this is basically a bunch of hexagons that we could, we're looking down on, right? So if the hexagon is my hand, I'm looking down on it. Um, this is a picture of the material itself, I believe. Um, and then I believe C is the electronic band structure. Ooh, 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 oops. I went back accidentally. No, let's go back to where we are. Okay, so, yes. So they're saying, this is, this is perfect. Um, so they're saying that they're getting volume shrinkage ideally in at A and B. So these rings are getting smaller and smaller and sp smaller by the change of what I believe the lead to the copper. Um, and perhaps this structural change is causing something else. Uh, this is the Fermi band diagram um, of the different material. Okay, sure, cool. Uh, let's re actually read what they say. Okay, they say the material is gray black. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, same color as typical superconductors. Uh, color is actually pretty important uh, because color is a light thing, and light is very important <laughs> for, for scientists, if I want to explain it like very briefly. So that's actually a decently important line, I suppose. Uh, the system of lead appetite is ivory colored. Oh, okay, so it's, it's a different color than what you usually get, sure. Three-dimensional network, um, replacement of copper ions in LK99 results in a volume reduction of 0.48% because copper is smaller than lead. Um, I believe, yeah. I don't think this is correct English, but I could be wrong. I believe it should be the replacement of lead with copper. As a result of the more precise analysis of XRD and XPS. So XRD is the thing we talked about, uh, basically by seeing the shape of the crystal structure. XPS looks more at the chemistry, um, how electrons move as a function of the applied uh, X, the applied X-rays. So they measure determine the variation of lead positions, one-dimensional electron density calculations along one crystallographic axis, um, control of the structure. Oh, okay, so... I believe this this equation is just them describing mathematically electron positions in this crystal lattice structure. Sure, um, I can roll with that. In the repeated triangular structure of lead 1 in the cylindrical column, the distance between lead 1 and 1 layer is decreased to 2.6185. The next layer is decreased. Sure. Okay, yes, yeah, so it's talking more about the crystal structure. Um, according to the results of the XPS, the binding energies of lead 2 and phosphorus were unchanged, although the tetrahedral phosphorus splitting value between lead uh, slightly decreased. Okay, yeah, so again, XPS lets us look at sort of how things are chemically bound to one another um, and how they change as a function of the applied X-rays. 
Um, pseudomonts are interpreted as a cyclone, blah, 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 blah. Okay. They confirm that they see a superconducting quantum well generated between uh, lead one and oxygen. Okay. So, time to talk about superconducting quantum wells. Basically. So basically, quantum wells describe some sort of structure where we have a well in which, like a hole, in which electrons and something else can live in, and barriers that they don't like to live in. Now, normally in quantum wells, um, you can sort of like move from one well to the other. We just sort of like teleport electrons from one well to some sort of adjacent well. It's a thing that electrons do. They're weird. Um, basically, they though they're saying in this paper that their wells have some innate superconducting properties. Superconducting usually is um, based... In short, superconducting can happen because electrons sort of bind together, pull and push each other, and act as one communal blob instead of normal conductors where they just push and pull each other. Basically, they're saying that this that these conduct that these quantum wells enable superconducting because whenever one thing wants to move and teleport to an adjacent well, it's pulling another one behind it, and so on and so forth, and it's basically making the entire thing move as one. I said before that normal conductors work because, well, normal conductors have resistance because each electron can bump into something else and lose energy. Superconductors mean that everything inside it acts as one. So one thing bumping doesn't stop it at all because everything else is just sort of pushing it together as well. Everything needs to bump at once for something to stop. So if one thing bumps, it's being pulled by the other instead, so it just keeps on moving as normal. And they're saying that these sort of wells, these, well, the barriers between the wells, mean that that's helping create this sort of communal mass of electrons that all have to move together and therefore create superconductivity. Again, big if true. Uh, if this is correct, this is like super, super cool. No one before has suggested superconductivity via this mechanism. Uh, they do say that in 2002, a paper by Koji and co-workers, it all means and co-workers, um, had similar signals and a similar superconductivity, um, but they didn't say that their superconductivity was caused by those quantum wells. Um, basically, the authors here are saying that they got superconducting quantum wells, and also those people 20 years back did too. They just didn't know it at the time. So yeah, um, that is pretty cool. It is nice to see to refer back and actually have prior evidence and so there is some evidence to, to what they're saying at the very least um so yeah next heat capacity basically they're talking about the functions of temperature um, this is just a cool thing to to have and it's relevant because again we're discussing changes uh the main thing about this is the fact it works at higher temperature heat capacity equation um ba -ba 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 -bum, ba -ba 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 -bum. It's nice, but it's not like the, the most super relevant to the superconductivity itself, I think. Um, I could be wrong. Again, not an expert. Ah, so here they do talk a bit more about the superconducting quantum wells. Um, basically, they're saying that previous works, um, Josephson was an old, old guy decades back, um, that uh, electrons can indeed, again, teleport through like walls and things. Um, and when they do teleport, they have zero resistance. So by making them, forcing them to teleport to warp uh, tunnel, is the correct word, through these barriers, through these quantum wells, they do create that overall superconductivity. Uh, which is nice. Um, additional experiment results will be published in the next paper, um, which we will briefly get to, I suppose. So yeah, um, I believe this is the conclusion. Yeah, so they're like, okay, so why does this material have superconductivity at room temperature and ambient pressure? They're saying that they have their structure, take out the lead, put in copper instead, which causes the thing to shrink. Um, this shrinking creates these quantum wells, so this sort of layers of resistors, and because electrons can sort of teleport and tunnel through these barriers with zero resistance, all the electrons sort of work together to teleport through them layers at a time and therefore have zero resistance, unlike, again, normal conductors where they just might bump into one another and whatever else and create resistance that way. 
Um, and they say, cool, there are many, yeah, many possibilities, including magnets, motors, cables, flotation trains, power cables, qubits for quantum computers, antennas, yeah, so basically everything. And they do say, uh, our new development will be a brand new historical event that opens a new era for humankind. Um, again, if this is true, I, I don't think this is, like, too much of an exaggeration. Like, yeah, this, this is, um, this is cool. Like, like they said, um, you know, they, they say that we, we describe things as the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. You know, they're the materials that defined our generation. Like, defined generations, centuries, and millennia. Um, people, um, in that sense, call today, like, the Silicon Age, because we're all about computers, which are run by silicon and maybe we can have a room temperature superconducting uh lead appetite age <laughs> from now on um so so yeah uh this is the second paper they mentioned so briefly skim through it it doesn't seem to have too much interesting that i can weigh in on um basically they do go a bit more detail into the synthesis method which is really really nice um so basically they have this three-step process uh first they create this metal called lenarchite then they create uh, copper phosphate, and then they phosphide, something like that. And then they mix them together uh, to create their superconducting material, which is really, really nice. Um, because it's, it seems like super, super easy, uh, which is really, really cool. And means that if this is true, it can actually be like really, really reproduced. Basically, um, yes, yeah, so in their crystal tube, in their vacuum tubes, um, they create a lenarchite by combining lead oxide and lead sulfate to create this guy. Um, they combine copper and phosphorus to create this guy. Uh, 24 hours for this, 48 hours for this. They get them both together. Uh, they're basically getting these things, they're powdering them up, um, and then just mixing them together, heating them up, and then powdering them up again, mixing them together and heating it up for this third step um, to create the metal they, they create. Um, they're saying, I believe, that the sulfur mostly gets removed. Again, not entirely. We saw before there were these small sulfur, copper sulfur impurities. But yeah, so they create their metal in the end. Um, they also show the X-ray structure, which is nice. Um, again, I do love XRD. Um, in this first one, we have basically the same thing we saw in the previous paper. So everything is slightly shifted right in the real material compared to um, uh, their theory, compared to the models, um, the normal models. Uh, this is the same thing, just zoomed in a bit more and showing different concentrations. I believe of that copper, of the copper phosphate, um in inclusions um so with more doping with more addition actually yeah yeah so we can see that in blue we have the true like lead appetite structure the theory they compare it to and they do make it this way they do get this perfect peak um in red and black they have the structures once they've added in more of that copper which would as they say cause that squ squishing um the contraction of the unit cell and therefore a shift of the peak towards the right and i believe in figure c they um basically they took their theoretical model uh, what they say it should look like uh calculated what the xrd what the x-ray diffraction should look like um if it had the structure they say and this is what they get basically they're saying that yeah hey look these guys are fully aligned we, we did do our, we did actually we do actually match what we see which is very nice um, what else do they have here? So they have more about the structures. Oh, they talk about more of their method. Yes, yeah, so, they, so they're saying that they do create these wells that do create this conduction in this one direction. Basically, they're creating these bu a bunch of wires that all go the same way, which are superconducting through the material, which is nice. Um, yeah, and then this is levitation. This is about Meissner effect. Um, basically, magnets and superconductors together have some cool effects. Um, magnetic fields just don't like superconductors, so they go around and that does a bunch of weird things and basically makes um, superconductors and metals like superconductors and magnets just float on top of one another. Um, you can see if cool videos on this if you just search for like, I don't know, Meissner effect. But yeah, um, and yeah, so they're saying that they do get this Meissner effect, this levitation at room temperature, which again, super cool if true. Um, yeah, and then it's just a bunch of stuff that we discussed earlier in the previous paper. So this one is basically the same thing, just going in more detail, which is nice. More detail about the actual process itself, as opposed to their explanation, which was valuable in the first one. So yeah, um, I think that's basically the main bulk of it. And the interesting question, therefore, becomes, um, what do I think about this 
as a whole. And if what I've been saying so far is like enough indication, I, I do think that it is correct to be sketchy. Um, well, not to be sketchy, to be suspicious. Um, not about this paper specifically, but like of all science. Um, so how science usually works, you know, especially if a physicist, if you, especially if you are a physicist, you will first post to archive just to get it out there um, to show you did it first. Then it'll go through the peer review process where scientists just give it like a seems legit, uh, seems good. And then it'll get um, published properly and people will be much more willing to cite it and look to it and trust it. Uh, more willing to trust it, um, I will emphasize. It's never fully confirmed. Science is always a process of like learning and relearning and unlearning. And a lot of paper, a lot of science that is published, oftentimes um, cannot re be reproduced. Um, more often than not, just because science is weird, things are weird. Life is is just weird. And, you know, maybe, maybe something just specifically works in, like, one specific lab in the world. Maybe, maybe like, their aircon was up too high, or maybe the phase of the moon had a, ch a change in gravity or, or something dumb like that. Not literally those examples, but, yeah, things can be very specific, and things can change, and things can be really hard to reproduce. And we don't always know why. Things that are most valuable are the things that stand the test of time, um, that stand the test of time and have many other discoveries pinning on it. So like, you know, in the modern in the modern day, things like general relativity, um, or yeah, general relativity, special relativity, um, e equals MC squared, you know, stuff that Einstein did. So much of modern te technology relies on that, um, relies on that, and that's how we know it's it's true, or as true as we can say it is. Because so much further stuff relies on it. And so much further stuff uses it. Um, this is all to say that this isn't, um, this paper isn't like enough to prove that it is true. Um, it's proved that it's true if people can use it a lot more, if everyone around the world can create this. Um, well, not everyone, but you know, if a lot of labs in the world are able to create this and prove this, um, then it's good. Um, if a lot of labs start pivoting to this direction and start actually getting results, it's good. So we won't know for some time. Luckily, the time that it'll take to reach that point is surprisingly short, I think, just because their method for creating this material is very, very, very simple. Um, again, they basically just got these four materials, uh, copper, phosphorus, uh, lead oxide, and lead sulfate, basically just mashed them together in a furnace, a furnace at particular pressures and whatever else and so on um but it becomes easy so to speak this is the type of equipment that are in most uh, physics condensed matter physics labs um which means that honestly in the coming weeks we will probably actually have a better idea of how true or otherwise this is um early on in this video i think i mentioned something about how i wanted to give you all in the keep a pin on this hydrogen sulfide or HGM superhydride thing. The reason for that is because those two papers were published by, I believe, the group of Diaz, um, Ranga, Diaz, and co-workers. Uh, this paper was another room temperature superconducting paper. This is one of the ones that did say you needed super, super high pressure, but this was also a big if true paper. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the work published via this group have been under a lot of scrutiny and appear to be in the not true category. So it is not big because it was not true. Um, and yet it did make big waves. There was a lot of media uh, looking into it. Um, a lot of scientists you know, would have spent a lot of time trying to replicate this to see that it was basically not true, uh, not real. Uh, but also that's what's needed to do to, to basically just be like, no, you give it the benefit of that if you have the time and then you do doubt if it doesn't work um if it does work well you're, you're like an early investor good job uh, enjoy your lead in making a lot of money or a lot more cool scientific discoveries but yeah um this is all to say that i think it's this is still an archive paper so again no scientists have officially like fully said if it's uh, approved it when it i believe this will eventually get published um, but then that will rely on other scientists replicating their data and seeing how 
you know, whether things actually are superconducting like this. Um, yeah, I'm not a superconductivity expert. I do do solid state physics, condensed matter physics, whatever I call it, material physics. That's, that's what I like calling it. Um, so I do have that background. And from that background, I think that their data seems really, really cool. Their mechanism for explanation does seem nice. All I wonder is why um, no one's why no one's really seen this before, particularly because it's so easy. If it is easy and it does work, though, that just makes the authors like that much more of like geniuses for finding this out. And yeah, I guess we'll only see it in the coming weeks. With that being said, um, I have work to do tomorrow. I'm just gonna trim this down, post it. And yeah, so I hope you all have a good week. See you all next one. Take care.